somebody's hand. Let them know that you're blessed tonight. They're blessed. You're glad to see you in the house of the Lord. glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise in this house. The ushers are making their way down tonight to receive our Sunday evening tithing offering. Man, I'm looking forward to what the Lord's going to do tonight. Come on, how many of you come expecting something from God tonight? Amen, we're just going to believe that he's going to pour out his spirit, that he's going to speak through his messenger tonight, that we're going to receive the word of God into our life. And so I'm looking forward to what he's going to say to me. And I hope that your hearts and minds are ready. And so we're just going to ask the Lord to bless this offering. 
and continue with our worship service tonight. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this night you've given us to be in your house with your people. I pray that in this moment as we get ready to receive our tithe and offering, Lord, that we would give, God, out of obedience to your word. God, that we would give because not only is it what we're supposed to do, but God, I pray for those tonight, maybe they're just thinking, oh, I have to do this. Lord, I pray that before they leave, it'd be something that they want to do tonight because you've blessed them so much. And so, God, we're going to thank you for what you do in this service. We're going to praise you for it. We leave it in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Worship with us tonight once you've given.
Come on, why don't you just lift your hands all across this sanctuary tonight? Come on, why don't you just right now with your with your hands lifted in a in a position of surrender, just go ahead and tell the Lord, God, I'm I'm making room for you tonight, God. God, let me hear your voice speak, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you in this house. We worship you in this house, Jesus. Here is where I lay it down Every burden, every ground This is my surrender This is my surrender Here is where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender And I will make room Lift your voice. To do whatever you want to. Make that your prayer tonight. To do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you. To do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. Ah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you really mean that? tonight could you just lift the other hand and then let's just tell him i know we just sang about it could you just tell him lord whatever you want to do tonight in me lord whatever you decide to do god we just give you ourselves tonight lord we yield ourselves to you spirit soul and body god we ask you tonight to have your way and to do whatever you desire to do among us lord we give the enemy no place we give the enemy no place in this service God, we just lay our lives at your feet and we trust, Lord, that your will 
is being accomplished in our life. And God will be sure to give you all the praise and all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for coming to church on Sunday, on Sunday evening. Amen. Thank you for being here. I, I uh, know that you had other options. You could have stayed at home, and, and uh, some did, but you're here, so we might as well have church with you here. Amen. Thank you for uh, uh, being faithful to being here this morning and, and for allowing me to, to uh, step out as I went to Sunnyside and met with that congregation there. We're just looking for great things. Amen. If you have a Bible with me, turn to Genesis, or you have a Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 14. We'll go back and try to finish what I started this morning. And um, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, praying for uh, Pastor Gary. Uh, Many of you know that his brother uh, passed away in Texas, and uh, I'll be leaving early, early in the morning, drive to Texas to be there with Pastor Gary and his family tomorrow. And then uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, Brittany texted me about Robert, and and uh, he has uh, had a, uh, a few things take place this afternoon, but they've taken care of it, and he is uh, back to being stable. And so, um, Robert, he's fighting, amen, and the Lord's fighting for him, and um, and so thank you for your continued prayers. Why don't do you, you have a need tonight? We talk about other. You have a need. Why don't we just take our needs to the Lord and ask the Lord to help us all tonight? Can you help do that? Lord, I pray you see tonight the uplifted hands recognizing a need that we have. And uh, Lord, you're able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ever ask or think of. Lord, there are people in the room tonight that need a miracle. There are people that are watching that need a miracle. Lord, we just happen to know the miracle worker. And so, Lord, I just pray that you will meet all of the needs, that you'll go beyond them. I pray for Pastor Gary tomorrow. Uh, Lord, as they uh, face some difficult times in the death of a family member, that the Holy Spirit would bring comfort to them. I pray you'd continue to heal Robert's body and meet all the needs recognized in this room tonight. We'll be sure to give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said, Genesis chapter 14, verses 1 through 16. I won't go back over it. I know that you're going to read it. There's a war going on in Genesis chapter 14. We originally started preaching in Genesis chapter 15. I'll be back there next week. But I didn't think you could understand or we ought to try to understand what's happening before. Before we get on to what I'm going to preach to you in Genesis chapter 15 next week. And so we backed up and we just saw in Genesis chapter 14 that there's a war going on. And, um, and kings are battling kings, nations are battling nations, and folks are fighting folks, and folks are fighting everywhere. Uh, and it's just like today, um, folks fighting everywhere over, over really just a whole bunch of nonsense. Um, there, there's just a lot of things that were going on here. Uh, if you go on and study this, there was a lot of nonsense, and there's a lot of nonsense going on today with people battling back and forth, but it is the world we live in. We're living in the end times, and Jesus is coming soon. That's the good news. Even so, just come tonight. That'd be fine by me. That'd be fine with me if we didn't see Monday morning, amen? If we didn't see Monday morning on the face of the earth, we woke up up in heaven in the morning on Monday morning, amen? And uh, we didn't have to bury Pastor Gary's brother, that we just went right on to heaven, and there we are. So, um, but we're, we are living in the end times, and Jesus is coming, and the enemy is at work. And so that's exactly what you're seeing going on here um, in, in the Bible in Genesis chapter 14. I said to you this morning, I won't go back and redo all of that, but uh, the purpose of this chapter in chapter 14 is not to show and to talk about the war. It was actually to talk about the purpose of, the, of chapter 14 was to show the courage and faith of Abram. And that's what I want to talk to you tonight is about faith for a few minutes. I said this morning that uh, the first point I tried to say to us this morning is that there is a need for courageous faith. Uh, we, we need believers today to have a courageous, fearless, bold faith. That's what we need. We need people that are able to tell what they believe in about Jesus Christ. I need to know it. I need to be proud of it. I need to be bold for it. And I need to speak of it. Amen, amen, and amen. And so we need to know all of those things, and we need a courageous faith. I talked to you about that this morning, that Lot uh, has been taken captive. Lot was the brother or the nephew of Abram, 
And the enemy has come and taken everything that he had. And uh, took everything they had, took all their possessions, took all of their things, took Lot himself, took some of the people as well, and now Lot is captive. Now Lot is a slave. And so I want to go back to something that I said this morning because I wanted to take just a second tonight um, uh, to talk to you about it a little clearer, and then I'll make two more points about faith and we'll go home. I said to you this morning that Lot, there, there's a lot to be said about Lot. Uh, in chapter 14 and I said to you this morning the first thing there was to be said about Lot was that he was actually living in Sodom. Lot is is doing something he shouldn't be doing. He is living in a place that he should not be living. He is a part of things that he should not be a part of but he is there. And I said to you that in Genesis chapter 13 that the Bible actually says that Lot had pitched his tent towards Sodom. He's living where he should not be. He's a part of things he should not be. And, and he has gotten so enamored with, with Sodom. He has gotten so involved in the city that he now has moved there. And the Bible said pitched his tent on a valley that overlooks the city. So every time Lot wakes up, every time Lot walks out, uh, of, of his tent, he is looking towards, he is focused on where his heart is headed. This afternoon, do you have the pictures? Do you have the pictures there? This afternoon, um, I was sitting on my front porch, and my pretty little wife went to Tulsa yesterday shopping and, and went to Cheesecake Factory. Praise the Lord. And, and, and so she went there, and she brought me back one of my favorite things from there, and one of my favorite things from there is the banana cheesecake. It is absolutely wonderful. And so she knows that, so she brought me some back last night, and I, I had already had supper on my own, and she brought that in. I couldn't help myself, and I had two bites and stuffed it in the back of the refrigerator. And, and so this afternoon, I was, found myself home alone again. And um, I actually beat them home from the business meeting at Sunnyside, and I was there by myself. So I had a fried Spam sandwich. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It'll be served at the marriage supper of the Lamb, I know. And, and so I had myself a fried Spam, spam sandwich. I normally, normally put mayonnaise on it, but I had the very same thing last night because I was home alone. So I had mayonnaise last night, and I thought, today, I'm going to have mustard. I'm going to swap it up a little bit, Brother Jeff. So I put mustard on that, and, and I inhaled that only to go to the refrigerator and open up, and there was the rest of that cake, uh, that uh, cheesecake. And so I got it, to which I went out and sat on my front porch and ate every single bite of it. I was sitting there thinking about what I'd said to you this morning and the things that went on at Sunnyside. I was sitting there thinking about all of that. And, and as I was sitting there on my front porch, go back to the first picture. As I was sitting there on the front porch, I just started thinking about my front door. And I thought about what I said to you this morning. The scripture said that Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. If you think about a front door, and this may be very simple to you if it is, just stay with me. I'll, I'll catch up with you in a minute. But I, I was sitting there on the front porch and I thought, you know what? The front door of most every house is just about in the center of every home. If you think about it and you drive by most homes, most front doors are just about in the center of the house. If not, they are just off a, a bit this way or a bit that way. But most of them are just about in the, in the center. Now, there is a back door. There are side doors. Uh, we don't use this door all the time, mostly uh, going in and out, out to the front porch or out to the front yard. Uh, but mostly we use the garage door. When we pull in, raise the garage door and go in the garage door. But I sat there this afternoon and I got to thinking about that. And I thought, I was thinking about what I said to you this morning. And I, I, I was just thinking that, that a lot of things have happened at this front door. Um, and, and most of the front doors of our houses, all of our kids' pictures as they go back to school on the first day of school, for some reason, all of our pictures are at the front door. And, and of every picture that we have of our kids on their first day, we all go out on the porch and we take pictures at the front door. 
And so I sat there this afternoon. I was thinking about that. And, and then I got to thinking about what I said to you. Go to the next picture. That <clears throat> most every morning I will walk to the front door and I look out the window and that's what I see. And that is a reminder of the blessing of God in my life that I see every morning. You can't see it, but if you look a little farther on past the tree line with all the leaves gone, I can see the sign out here, or could see before we changed it, I could see the sign out here in the parking lot. So not only am I seeing all the blessing of God immediately right there in front of me, but I'm seeing the rest of what the Lord <clears throat> When I walk out that front door, that's my focus. That's what I see. That's what my heart may be pointed towards. Go back to the first picture, if you will. And the scripture said that Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. Every day that Lot walked out his front door, he wasn't looking at the blessing of God. He was looking at where the desires of his heart wanted to be. He was following his heart. Then I got to thinking this afternoon, you know, if an enemy is going to come into my house, he's going to have a hard time. But if an enemy is coming to my house, he's probably not coming through the front door. He's probably not going to come knock on the front door and ask if he can come in. He's going to find another way other than the front door to try to get in. He's going to go through a window. He's going to go through, I don't know if he'll slide down the chimney. I don't know what he'll do. But chances of him going through that door are awful slim. Chances of the enemy going straight to the door of your soul is awful slim. But he will find a way always to get in so that he causes you to lose focus of what God has placed in your life. The front door, that's the door to my heart. That's the door, that's the, the center of the door is in the center, the, the, the door is in the center of the house. It's in the middle of everything. When you walk in the front door, you have access to everything. If you come into one of the other doors, you might have access to only an immediate area. But when you walk in that front door, you've got access to it all. The Bible said that, that Sodom has pitched his tent towards where his heart is headed. That's where he's going. We'll come back to that in just, in just a minute. I said to you this morning that, that where your heart is currently headed or where your heart is currently pointed, that is where you will wind up. That's why the scripture talks about and we preach about and we talk about is your heart right? Keep your heart right. Your heart is the window to your soul. I'm not saying, we don't say, can you keep your mind right? I don't know if anybody in this room can do that. But I can, with God's heart, keep the door to my soul in the place that it ought to be. Come on, I'll help you in just a second. And so, wherever Lot's heart was, wherever your heart is currently pointed right now, if you are, if your heart is towards being financially successful, then that is all that you are going to focus on. If your heart is focused on gaining the things of the world, then that is where you are headed towards. If your heart is not solely focused on the things of God, then you'll wind up where it's pointed. And that's where Lot is. So let me remind you just quickly a couple of things about Lot. I'll come back to this at the end. Lot lost everything. The enemy does not just want to take a few things from you. The enemy doesn't want you to just be offended. The enemy wants you to be so mad and so seething that you eventually wind up waving the white flag. and get, He didn't stop at being offended. That, that was just the start. He is, in, he is inept. He is out to cause you to lose everything. Lot lost his possessions, he lost his home, he lost his property, he lost his farm, he lost his livestock, he lost his money. He loses everything because of what he's focused on. Are y'all back there with me where we stopped today? He's lost it all. And he now is a prisoner of war. They have taken him captive. Not only did they just show up to get his stuff, but now they've got him. 
Not only did they show up to get his cows and, and his chickens and his turkeys and, and, and whatever else they can put their hands on, but now they've got him. And, and they're dragging him off with them and he becomes their slave. That's exactly what the devil wants to do in your life. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do in the church is that we so lose focus that we become a slave on what our heart is intended to get success of. Am I, I'm, I'm trying to get us somewhere. And, and so where is your heart? Only you know, I've said before to you that when we've talked about tithing, it's a heart issue. When we've talked about can you be healed, it's a heart issue. When we talk about our relationship with God, it's a heart issue. It's not a mind issue because, because that's not where God operates. God doesn't operate in my mind. He's trying to get me to get my mind right, but he's operating in my heart. This thing that we're talking about tonight, it's a heart issue. Where's your heart? I know you're the Sunday night crowd, but is your heart right? What is your heart focused on? Where is your heart currently pointed towards? Where is your heart pointed towards tonight? What are, what's your heart pointed toward to? That is where you're going to wind up. Just like Lot. So now he's a prisoner of war. They've got him. He's going to be their slave. And being their slave, he's going to do what they want him to do. When you're not serving the Lord, you can't do the things that you will to do. You are influenced more by the things of the world and the things of your heart than you are the things of God. Because the things of the world cloud the things of God. Okay? So now he's a slave. He's being deported. He's being taken to some foreign land. To serve as a slave to the enemy. And that's what's going to happen. So first of all, and I stay with me, there is the need for courageous faith. We have to have courageous faith in a time that we're living in where, where nothing is really wrong with anything. There's nothing really wrong with doing anything. If you feel like it, do it. You can get away with it. That's not just in the world. It's in the church too. It's not just out there. It's in this building. If it makes you feel good and you can get away with it and nobody finds out and even if everybody finds out and you still didn't get in trouble and you didn't get arrested and nobody died, it's okay because you got away with it. So now things have become okay. There's nothing wrong with anything. But there's a need for courageous faith. Secondly tonight, in verse 13... In chapter 14, verse 13, we see that there is a call. First of all, there is a need. Everybody say need. We need, you need, I need a courageous faith. Somebody's got to stand up. Somebody's got to say, that's wrong and that's right. I understand in the world of politics and, and a whole lot of other things today that that line is completely blurred if not erased. But it's not in this book. I said it's not in this book. I said in the world you and I live in, there is not a line or it is very, at the very least, it is completely blurred. But it is not in this book. That's why we have trouble at times reading the book. So there is a need for courageous faith. Secondly, in verse 13 tonight, we see that there is a call for courageous faith. I'm trying to help us tonight. There's a need for it. And then second of all, there is a call for it. Verse 13. I'm reading to you here from the King James Version. The Bible says, under the, under the second point I'm making to you about the call for courageous faith, there's the need, and then there's the call for courageous faith, verse 13. And there came one that had escaped, comma, in your Bible there's a comma. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Ishkal, and brother of Anur, and these were confederate with Abram. This is a good scripture. I'm talking about the call for a courageous faith. The scripture said, again, there came one that had escaped. We don't know who they are. 
We don't know in the King James Version. We don't know if it's a male. We don't know if it's a female. It just says there came somebody that had escaped. Escaped from where? We're talking about being in Sodom. So there's somebody in Sodom that had escaped the enemy. And they have now ran to these people, to these three men. And they have told them what's going on. For they dwelt in the plain of Mamre and the, of the Amorite, brother of Ishkal, the brother of Anur, and these were confederate with Abram. That's great sentence right there. Let me talk to you about this first. Some person, somebody, we don't know again if it's male or female, we assume it to be a male, we don't know, has escaped the invading army. And that person is probably from Sodom because they knew who Lot was. Are y'all tracking with me? They're probably from Sodom. They may have been to, so- to, to Lot's tent. They may have been in the local McDonald's together. We don't know, but we know that they're from Sodom because they knew who Lot was. And they knew that Abram and Lot were relatives. This escapee couldn't... Couldn't he have gone to somebody else other than Abram? Y'all stay with me. Couldn't he have gone? If he, if there's so many people at this time and so many armies and so many kings and so many nations represented here that are fighting, couldn't this guy have gone to somebody else other than Abram? What do you wind up going to Abram for? Well, we're not exactly told why. But the point is this. Abram was sought at the moment of crisis. He was the person that was sought at the moment of crisis. He was known to be a man of faith and courage. And that's exactly what was needed at the time. And so the man sought out Lot and found him. I'll tell you the same is needed today. As we face crisis in the world and we face crisis in the church, there needs to be a group of people that are courageous and are full of faith that in the middle of a crisis, they know where to go. They know that they can come to Van Buren First Assembly and there's somebody there that will pray for me. There's somebody there that will stand in the gap for me. In the middle of a crisis, people need to know where to go. This ought to be a place they flood to. There shouldn't be war in the church. There shouldn't be war going on. There's enough crisis without all of that. And people were looking for a safe place to go. And people are looking today for a safe place to go. It ought to be the church. Somebody say church. It ought to be an altar. It ought to be that somebody comes strolling in the door. And they're not concerned about a gossip. They're not concerned about somebody putting it on Facebook. They're not concerned about being rejected. But in the middle of their crisis, they're able to stumble down an aisle somewhere and find themselves in an old-fashioned altar with some people filled with the power of the Holy Ghost to, to help them through their dilemma but we're too busy fighting we're too busy fighting we're too busy fighting about everything we're too busy they were too busy and so he finds Abram and Abram has exactly what this man needs he doesn't label who he is could be anybody could be you, could be me. We've all got things in our closet that we're not proud of. The Bible says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. All of our, right, our, right, is as, as our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. There ain't nobody in this room perfect, including myself. We've all done things we're not proud of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this could be anybody. He's living in Sodom. Could have been anybody. Could be you. Could be me. But he knew where to go in the time of trouble. He chose Abram because he had heard. Maybe Lot had told him about his uncle and said, man, one day I want you to meet my uncle. He's a great man of faith. He's a, maybe Lot had told him. Maybe he had heard about a, 
at the local Starbucks back then. I don't know. But the man knew exactly where to go. And you and I as the brotherhood of Christ ought to have a safe place to go when there is difficulty and crisis in our life, when we've gotten the pink slip at home or on the job, when we've had rejection, when we've got cancer, when we have heart problems, when we've lost everything we've got, when nobody wants us, there ought to be a brotherhood on the inside of this building where people ought to feel comfortable to come and say, I need you in my life. I'm preaching better than some of you are responding. This ought to be a brotherhood. There's no place for war. People ought to know that's where you go to get help. I'm not making fun of nobody. Over the years, I've had people from other religions, other denominations at time, at times when they, they don't believe. Listen, let me just say it like this. They'll preach that we're wrong on the Holy Ghost. They'll preach that we've got it wrong on salvation. <laughs> They'll preach that we've got it wrong on speaking in tongues. But you let the doctor tell them something bad and who they come looking for. Come on, somebody. I don't hold that over their face, uh, over their head. I tell them I'm glad you're here because today I'm going to exercise the power that God gave on the inside of me. Let's join hands. I don't care if you're Baptist, uh, if you're if you're whatever you are, whatever you claim today. We're going to be followers of Jesus. Uh, they'll show up and say, "Will you?" Pray? I know I don't go to your church. Uh, I go to so and so's church. Uh, but will you pray? Yes, sir. I will pray for you at that point in time what they're looking for is somebody that can touch heaven they're looking for somebody that can get a hold of the king of kings and the lord of lords they don't care what you think about the music they don't care what you think about the carpet what they need to know is do you know god that is good you bet it's good Can y'all handle this? I don't know. The dude out there right now that's dating a dude needs to know that when he comes in the door, you're not going to shove it. The person out there that's as high as a kite right now needs to know there's a safe place I can go. They need to have a feeling when they drive by this building, something's drawing me. Come on, somebody. They need, there needs to be such a power of the Holy Ghost in this room that right now as they're driving by and their steering wheels have to fight the steering wheel to keep from turning in the parking lot. Something is wrong with my car. No, honey, there ain't nothing wrong with your car. It's the Holy Ghost drawing you to a place and to a people that are in this with you. a strip of gear and I told myself I lie to myself every time I told myself I'd walk in here and just talk to you tonight that's a lie somebody's got to help would you look at somebody and say somebody somebody's got to help can I ask you in these last days and we are in a crisis we're in a bad bad crisis 18 million people newcomers come across the border I understand all that I'm compassionate and all those things but it is going to affect us we have politicians can't get along it is going to affect us we have an economy that is not going to last it is going to hit rock bottom what are we going to do when that happens I want to be a part of a brotherhood and a sisterhood that no matter what goes on and no matter what happens I know that come hell or high water that you are here for me you are in this with me and that you can touch heaven with me and that you will believe for anybody else that comes through the door. That is what we're here for. So there's a call for courageous faith. Somebody had it. We don't even know who they are. Somebody had it. They ran off. They fled the enemy. They got away. And they got to Abram to tell him what was going on. Why? Because in the moment of crisis, they knew exactly 
who the man was they needed to go see. Can I tell you that in a crisis, a crisis, crisis also often, I'm sorry, stirs people to the point of discouragement and difficulty because of the crisis. And it's a sad thing that because of a crisis, people turn to Christ. I should say it this way. It is, um, it is disappointing that it takes a crisis for somebody to come to Jesus Christ. But however it takes you to get here. Come on, I've had people tell me over the years, Pastor, I'm praying that the Lord will do whatever he has to do to get my family here. Okay, you better buckle your seatbelt. You better hold on because they're going to get mean before they get clean. <laughs> they're, I'm telling you, they're going to get mean. They're going to get, they, my pastor used to say they'd fight a striped spider. They're going to get mean before they get clean. Why? Because you said, Lord, do whatever you have to do. Just get them here, okay? Then I'm going to cause a crisis in their life. Whatever it may be, a sickness cause them. They may have lost their job. They may have lost, then we come back the next week and say, Pastor, Pastor, they lost their job. They lost, well, well, you said whatever you have to do and then they turn to God my older sister's uh, 60 I think now she just had a birthday 60 or 61 and just had a birthday not long ago and my mother uh, my older sister has been involved in, in addiction all her life I'm talking about all all her life and, and um, in fact, I have a, I have a burn mark on my, right below my knee, right there on the inside of my leg, where she put a cigarette out on my, le on my knee when I, was six, when, I was, when I was six years old. And she has been involved in it all her life. And I have heard my mother say for years, Lord, whatever you've got to do. We have been to jail. I, when I was a kid, my mom threw us in the back of a brown caprice classic throw us in the back of that old car throw a blanket in there on top of us and we'd go set it to jail we'd sit outside the emergency room whatever it was to get her it'd go on and on and on until just a few years ago she's on the back of a harley riding with the guy down the middle of the highway he, they have a wreck in the middle of the interstate, cuts off his legs in the middle of the interstate. She had a, a smashed up elbow and stood up in the middle of that interstate looking at him and looked up in the middle of that interstate and said, God, if you will keep me alive right here, I'll do whatever it is to serve you. Whatever it takes. Come on, that's what my mama said. And today she's married to a Baptist preacher, pastor in a Baptist church. Don't you think that your family's gone too far? Don't don't you think that they're too far into Sodom for God not to change it? Lord, whatever you got to do, bring them in. If it's crisis, whatever it is, let them find themselves at an old-fashioned altar, making themselves... Y'all still believe in that? We still believe the blood works. We still believe the cross is effective. Sometimes it takes a crisis for them to turn to God. I prayed the sinner's prayer with them in their last 10 minutes of their life laying in the hospital. I've walked into the room with them where they're laying there just about to die. An infection and whatever eating, the, eating them from the inside out. I've stood there and said to them, I know how you are. I don't need to know the report. I don't need to know what the doctor said. I want to know if he comes before I walk out of this room, what about your eternal soul? And I've led them to the, right there on their deathbed to the Lord. And guess what? They're just as saved as I am. And somebody showed up in time to get them in the gate, to get them to the city. We are in the last hour. And the idea here is souls, souls. Souls in this last hour to get them to the city. Who's that? People who are in a crisis will seek out those who are strong in their faith and are courageous enough to walk it out. So, therefore, there's three things that you and I have to do. I'll hurry along. This is the second point. I only got one more. There's three things that you and I have got to do to walk out of courageous faith, to answer the call of courageous faith. Three things. You ready to write them down? First of all, you've got to be strong in faith, and, and you've got to have courage. You can't be strong in your faith if you only know what I preach today, because you'll forget it by next Sunday. Some of you forgot what I preached this morning, what I said last week. 
Whatever it may be, you got to know what you know because you know it because you lived it and you experienced it. I got to know it. I know it. I know it not because what he said or she said. I know it because it happened to me. <laughs> Come on. I, I love your testimonies. The Bible says that iron sharpens iron. I need you and, I, and you need me, contrary to popular belief. But what I need is an old-fashioned experience with an almighty God because nobody can take that away from me. They can come get my house and they can come get my car, but they can't take away what God in heaven has done in my life. They can't take away the fact that he set me free. He reached down in the miry clay, picked me up and set my, come on, am I preaching to anybody? And they can't take that from you. That's where your courage starts. If you're not exercising that testimony, you have no courage. You just have a knowledge of what you've heard. When I have an experience, I know what I'm talking about. Come on, somebody. When, I, when something happened to me right here that, no, I just had it happen this past week, and I can't explain it to you and can't tell you about it right now, but I've been working on something and praying for something for a long time. And I'm going to tell you, last week the Lord brought it to pass. And I couldn't even tell just for a minute because I've been so focused on what I thought was going to happen and how I thought it was going to happen. I was just about to miss it when in the right big middle of it the Lord said, Do you recognize me? in the middle of this I stopped and stood back and said thank you Lord I had nothing to do with this this is all you I want to tell you that he'll do the very same thing for you in fact I believe he'll do it for some of you this week if you'll stop focusing on what you want and start focusing on what you see he's at work all the time right in front of you but we get so focused on, whoosh, that's how it ought to be. That's what it ought to look like. And we fail to see the miracle right in your face. You got to be strong and you got to be a person of courage. Never weakening. That's tough. Because the enemy don't come to the front door. He comes to the side door. And I don't care who you are in this room. You are not so full of the Holy Ghost that you are exempt from that list. You are not so hotty totty, high and mighty, hooty tooty that it don't happen to you. In fact, you're the number one person it normally happens to. Why? Because pride has overtaken your relationship with the Lord. You ever read the story about Humpty Dumpty? Mm, I ain't read it in years. But I kind of remember it a little bit like this. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's men, horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And when you fall because of pride, the Lord, hmm, weakening. Let me go back to it because I think I said something there. The Lord said, never weakening. <clears throat> Can you go back to the picture real quick? I'm sorry. The first one. The enemy probably is not going to come through the front door. So he's going to go weaken some other areas that will get him the same access as going through the front door would. The enemy can't come directly to you with something because you know better about that one thing. So he goes around. There is another way here. Come on, I'm talking to you. There is, there is another way for access here. It's through their money. It's through their family. It's through the people the closest to you. It's through health. It's through your thinking. It's, there is another way here. We don't have to go straight head on. Because the first drink you take, you're not an alcoholic. The first drag you take off of a marijuana off mar or a cigarette, you're not, you're not addicted then. It is the fact that you got away with it once and you think you can do it again, empowers you to do it again. I'm preaching good to you. There is another way. The second thing you got to do that we have to do is we have to be alert to the crises that arise in the lives of others and be alert to the opportunity to help them. 
If we're going to be successful and we're going to help folks, in order to do that, i got to be alert to the things that are going on. I can't have my head in the sand not knowing or not wanting to pay attention just because I don't know nothing about it doesn't give me reason not to figure it out. Just because I don't want to know about it and I don't want to hear about it doesn't mean that it's not in existence in people's lives. Just because we don't want to hear about you fill in the blank, whatever your blank may be. Just because you don't want to hear about that and you don't want to talk about that, that don't mean it's not going in a whole bunch of other people's lives and that don't mean the Lord's not going to use me to help them in their lives so I need to be aware of what's going on. I spend a lot of my time studying about a lot of things that I don't ever preach. I spend a lot of my time studying a lot of things that go on in this world and watching the news simply not because I am, I am just ab- obsessed with knowing about what it is, but I need to know because the chances of somebody showing up in one of my services the next time is highly possible they're dealing with that very thing. I need to know how to help them. I need to know even the well... And the next one is, is that you need to be ready to help. You need to have faith and courage. You need to be aware of things that are going on in people's lives and be alert to the opportunity to help them. But then I need to be ready to help. I need to be there to encourage and to lead that person to trust in the delivering power of God. Listen to these three scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58. Paul said, therefore, my dear friends and sisters, stand firm. Period, he said. Let nothing move you. Wow. I wish I could go this week and nothing moved me. Do you? I wish I could go through one week and and just nothing phased me. No, no, no bad news, whatever, no anything, nothing, nothing. Paul said, let nothing move you. Lord, please help us have that ability. Lord, let let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, comma, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We're not wasting our time here tonight. We didn't waste our time here this morning. We're not wasting our time on discipleship. We're not wasting our time with the things of the Lord because he said that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. That means there's going to be a... We're not just doing it for funsies. We're not just doing it to have something on the calendar. When we're doing this, hopefully tonight, at least if one person leaves this room different than the way they showed up, then our labor tonight is not in vain. If somebody comes into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, then our labor is not in vain. This past week we had a funeral of a man that did not attend our church in this service, in this sanctuary and I was asked to preach it. At the end of it I said I would be doing this man a disservice if I did not ask you if you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Fourteen people in a funeral service said I want to know Jesus as my person. That labor this week was not in vain. It didn't make no difference if I knew the man, but I know the man. It didn't make no difference if I was in his life. I knew the life they needed. Come on, church. That ought to make you excited. So that takes everybody in the room off the excuse list. It don't make no difference if you know him or not. Preach Jesus. And it'll never be in vain. Well, we try to find people. We, we don't have pastors in this town. We got professional proselyters. They don't know anything about pastor, and they're professional proselyters. I've never done that in my life. Never will do it in my life. I've never sowed it, so I'll never be guilty of it. I'm not interested in swapping fish from aquarium to aquarium. I'm interested in getting new fish in my aquarium. Come on, somebody. It don't make no difference if I knew the man or not. I just happen to be put in those people's lives for that day to do a service for that family and to honor them. And I did so, and the Lord honored me by giving us 14 lives. Let me go back to this. We want to witness to people we know is already in church. (laughs) They don't need witnessing. The Bible said it's not the well I came for but the sick. 
We're trying to witness to other people that's already saved and is already in church. Can I, can I give you a little pastoral advice here? Leave them alone. Go find you somebody that's so addicted they can't even stand up. Come on, somebody. Go find you somebody tonight uh, that hell thinks they had a hold of. Uh, put your courage to work. Uh, put your faith to work. Uh, and watch the King of Kings uh, and the Lord of Lords uh, lead you to lead somebody to Him. That's good preaching, Pastor. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Carry each other's burdens. Carry each other's burdens, comma, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Wow. Pastor, what's the will of God for my life? Well, there's your one right there. Get involved in somebody else's life. Don't go snooping. Don't go gossiping. That's sinning. You find a need in somebody's life that you can meet or somebody that you can encourage and let the Lord handle the rest of it. I just read it to you. The Bible said that's the law of the Lord. You will fulfill the law of the Lord when you get involved in somebody else's life. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 through 10. Let us, new, let us not become weary in well-doing. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Anybody ever been weary? A couple of you? Tired? Let's talk about it. Tired? Sick of it? Don't want to hear it no more. He's going, to, he's going to sweat, preach, yell, scream. Same stuff. Sick of it. Same stuff over and over. No, no, no other kind of outcome. I keep doing it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of trying. I'm tired of reading. I'm tired of prayer meeting. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. Weary. And the scripture said, do not get weary in well-doing. For in the proper time, when's the proper time? I don't know, but I wish it was right now. I know that if I hold on, the Lord's on his way. Come on, somebody. I don't know when the proper time is because I didn't write the calendar. What I know is uh, if I will not get weary and well-doing and give up right in the middle of the will of God, uh, that on some day just like today, our Lord is going to show up. He's going to show up in the middle of it. He's going to show out. He's going to perform a miracle. He's going to deliver. He's going to save. He's going to baptize. He's going to revive. He's going to do what he said he would do if I don't give up. But there is an alternative way. It doesn't have to be just through the front door. The front door is pretty obvious. If you just run, kick that door down, I'm in. But there's some stuff behind that front door and a whole bunch of other doors that's going to cause a problem here. The problem is a lot of us don't have the doors guarded. The problem for a lot of us, the door is unlocked and is wide open. The scripture said, give no place to the enemy. Give no place. That's talking to us. Go read it. It's talking, that's talking to the church when he said, give no place to the enemy. It's talking to us. That means leave the door closed, guard the door, watch the door, oversee the door, nail the door shut, glue the door, nail it again, glue it again, whatever you have to do. Give no place to the enemy. When I gossip, I am... When I open the door to unforgiveness, bitterness, pride, grudges, whatever it may be, I am, a, I am opening the door. Go back to the picture, please. Leave the picture up there, would you? Go back to the picture. What I am doing is I am opening that front door and just leaving it in. And, and devil, you just come anytime you want to because you got access. We have done that. The world knows they're doing it. They don't, they, don't, they don't need this sermon right here. They know they're doing wrong. They, they know it's us. It's the church that continue to leave. Who, who shut the door? Who slammed the door? Christ on the cross slammed the door, nailed it shut with his blood, sealed it with the Holy Ghost. Who's go, who goes back and opens the door? Who took care of the work in the beginning? 
Who opened the door? Who gave place? Who gave a lending ear? Who jumped in? Who did it? We did it. I did it. You did it. Galatians, Ephesians said, give no place to the enemy. I'm on the phone looking at stuff you shouldn't be looking to. That's leaving the door open. I would never just leave that door open. Why do we do it as a church? We become weary. I submit to you. I haven't studied this, and I'm, I may get. I'm, I may be off here. If I'm off, you come correct me when it's over. I'll, I'll tell you. I'm sorry. I think we become weary because at times we have worked on becoming weary. We've worked to become weary. We have worked for a reason to leave the door open. I deserve this because of this. I deserve the entire cheesecake, not part of it. I deserve the whole thing because I had salad all week. Come on. I deserve to look at this stuff because I've been hurt. I deserve, I deserve to what I'm, what I'm doing and what I'm saying because I've been hurt. And we work ourselves, we work ourselves into a weariness. Let us not become weary in well-doing for at the proper time. There's a time. We will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, we just preached on opportunity for about eight weeks, time. If we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, comma, especially to those belonging to the family of believers. Wow. Wow, I'm going to read it to you again. Let us not become weary in well-doing, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. I don't know. I wish I did. I can't see down the tunnel of time. I don't know what God's going to do in our country. I don't know what God's going to do in this church. I don't, I don't know what tomorrow holds. We, we could be in heaven before we get home tonight. But what I do know, because the Bible said it, that if I will not give up, there will come a time the Lord will repay me for the work I have done. Can everybody agree on that? Could you shake your head and say yes or no? I just read it to you, so it ought to be 100% in the room. Yes, there is a time that God will repay. He said there is a proper time. I wish that were right now. I wish there weren't any more empty seats in this room. I wish that there was people all the way to the end of the gym, that this place was so full. Is that going to happen while we're living? I don't have any idea. I'm fasting for it. I'm praying for it. And I am certainly believing for it. But I believe there's a proper time. Read it to you. Look at it with me because you got your Bible. You brought your Bible with you. I know you did. Verse 10, therefore, as we have an opportunity, remember I preached to you eight weeks on what opportunity means. Opportunity is time. Therefore, as you have the time, not time yesterday, but time right now. Therefore, as you have the time, the opportunity, the time right in front of you right now, the scripture said, let us do good to all people, especially to those belonging to the family of believers. That means there should be no war in this house. Yeah, that's what it means. There should be no battling in this house. There should be no fighting in this house. There should be no division in this house. There shouldn't be no splits in this house. Because the Bible said, all the more I see the time approaching, let us not do evil unto people, especially to the people of the house of God. Why? Because we're to be a brotherhood. I don't have the same daddy as these guys right here, these fine men sitting on this front row, and we don't have the same mamas. 
We don't have, I don't think I'm kin to any guy sitting here on the front row. They're all wonderful guys, but I don't think I'm kin to any of them on this earth. But in heaven, we have the same royal blood flowing through our veins, and these are my brothers, and I will do anything just like I would a natural brother or sister. I will do anything for them. Why? Because we are under the same umbrella, that umbrella being Jesus Christ. Him having shed his blood for my family and for their family. The same blood that was spilled on the cross is the same blood spilled for them. It makes us family and come hell or high water. I'm going to do what I can for the family of God. But we fight. We fight. Because we disagree and we don't like and we misunderstand and we don't talk and we don't communicate and we don't have conversation like adults. And we war and we battle and we fight and we divide and all of those things and we wind up with exactly what has done the opposite right here. The scripture said to be kind to all people, especially to those belonging to the family of God. Verse 13, here's the third one, we'll go home. There is a call for courageous, I'm sorry, there is a need for courageous faith. There is a call for courageous faith. And then number three, there is a wise preparation for that faith. Verse 13, how do I prepare for that? So, I want to be courageous. You want to be courageous. <clears throat> You want to be courageous. I want to be a person of faith. I want to that when I come down and pray for. I don't think that I have ever just really walked up to somebody and said. Oh Lord just do whatever you want to do. <laughs> I don't care. Well, if you do it, do it. I don't. How many of you want somebody like that praying for you? Uh, I also don't want somebody praying for me. Just rolled out of their recliner. With oatmeal still run down the side of their face in the afternoon. <laughs> popcorn seeds on their shirt. Stumble in unprepared. Lord, do for them whatever you want to do. Cast the popcorn out of them. I don't care. Yeah. When you come down here, you need to know somebody that's got their hand on you is in agreement with you and believes for what you're facing. Come on, somebody. And so there's a preparation for that. How does that happen? I'll tell you. We'll go home. Verse 13. It's right there in front of us. Verse 13 shows us <clears throat> the whole scripture that I've read to you talks about the need for courageous faith, the call for courageous faith, and here's how you prepare for that, how that happens. Verse 13, and there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, same scripture as verse 2, or, or point number 2 I just made, brother of Ishkal, brother of Anur, and here, here's the key, here's how you prepare for it. And these, this is the King James Version, and these were confederate with Abraham. <laughs> Great word. I'm going to help you. How do I prepare for it? How do I become a person of great faith? How do I become a person of great courage? How do I become a person that, that I, I want to believe? I want to believe for healing. I want to believe for your family. I want to believe. How do I get there? Well, the scripture just told us right there how these guys did this. They all were in a pack, if you will. They were all in a, an agreement. And the Bible says that they were all confederate with Abram. The NIV says this. All of them were allied with Abram. All of them were confederate with Abram. What does confederate mean? Confederate means ally or one who assists in a plot or an accomplice or a partner. All of these guys that are listed here in verse 13 I just read to you, they were allies of Abram. They were assistants in the plot of Abram. They were accomplices or they were partners. What you need in life is a partner. You need somebody that will come hell or high water is in it with you all the way. They don't care what you look like, what you act like. They love you in spite of your flaws. They are a partner. They are a partner in crime. They are your ride or die. They're not going to walk out on you when times get bad. And they're not going to walk out when they are offended. They are with you through thick and thin. You need somebody that is confederate with you. And I'll tell you, we have one. His name is Jesus. He is a partner in every single thing that 
you do. He is your ride or die. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He won't turn his back on you. He is a partner for life. Confederate. Are we confederate? Are we partners? I've known Travis for 25 years. Stand up, Travis. I've known Travis for 25 years. He was the janitor at Muldrow when I started preaching revivals over there for 25 years, 25 years ago. He was the janitor there at that church. Clean the entire church himself. You could hear Tra Travis singing. You could hear Travis talking to himself. And he still does all of that today. <laughs> and if he don't listen to himself, he'll get on Facebook and stir up havoc even today. I'm taking your phone away from you, Travis. Stand up. I didn't tell you to sit down. I've been pastoring you for 25 years. You better do what I tell you to do, Travis. <laughs> I want to tell you that I love Travis all the way. Travis and I are partners. Come hell or high water, I'm with Travis, and Travis is with me. I've been through thick and thin with Travis. I've been through the good. I've been through the bad. I know Travis is going to, that God is going to heal Travis one day. Why? Because Travis has been faithful in the partnership that God has placed, and he'll do the same for for you Travis and I are confederate he smart mouthed off to me but he never knew anything to begin with so why would I I've been trying to get that dude saved for 25 years we are confederate He attended Sean Money's church. I knew that. Moved over here to take care of his mother. Travis called me. He said, I'm going to start coming to your church. I said, no, you're not. I got enough projects. I'm just, it's just a joke. Ministry joking, okay? But I did tell him, you ain't coming over here. You're not coming to my church. You belong at Sean Money's church. And if you come over here, I ain't having it cause a problem with me and him because we a confederate as well. And we ain't never had a problem. Don't you show up over here at our church, Travis. The next Sunday, Travis sitting back there smiling. <laughs> I went back there to him. I said, I'm calling your pastor after this service is over. And I'm going to find out if he knows where you are. And he said, it don't matter. Travis said, I've been in there and talked to him. And he knows what's going on in my life. And he let me go. Me and that dude right there is confederate. If anything ever comes between me and him, he'll disappear. <laughs> Here's the deal. Do you have a partner? I can't speak for the ladies because I are not one. I've lived with them all my life, family. I are not one. I know what I am. <laughs> There's no doubt. I know what I am. You need a partner in your life. What I was trying to say is I'm, I'm not a female I can't speak for y'all, but I can speak for the men because I am one. Here's what I know about most men. Most men don't have any friends. Most men have acquaintances, people that we are casual with throughout the day and throughout work. But most men, and I'm offending some of you maybe, but most men don't have a ride or die. 
So it's hard for me to understand then a relationship with God with somebody I can't see and somebody I can't put my hands on when what I can see and what I can talk to really don't want anything to do with me. Where are you most times? You're home. In the garage, working on things don't need working on. Where are you when you have time of need? Oh, I'm a man, and I can make it. If God didn't create you to need somebody else of the like kind, he would have never said iron sharpens iron. Travis sharpens me, and I better be sharpening Travis. Most people don't have a partner. Jordan and I are out yesterday. Somebody, would you come? Come on, don't start playing yet. Just sit there and smile. Jordan and I were out yesterday. They'd gone to Tulsa. So Jordan and I had the free reign of the place yesterday. We do normally anyway. Man, we spread gravel on the driveway. We drove tractors. We rode, I bet that child rode that four-wheeler 20 miles in my yard yesterday. And I couldn't care less. She riding that grass down. Most people would be, I don't care. Ride it till the wheels come off of it, honey. That child wagged them chickens all over everywhere. We, we moved goats. We chased goats across the property. We went on a safari. Property, I own a little bit of land across the road from me. It's got full of wood. She said, Dad, I, I, I'm mowed. I mowed the yard yesterday for the first time. God help us. I didn't want to do it, but it's starting to look bad. So I mowed the yard. She's riding the four-wheeler. I get done mowing the yard. She come over to me on the four-wheeler. She said, Dad, could we go on a safari? <laughs> sure. We live in Arkansas. Let's go. <laughs> Where are we going? She said, we're going to go across the street over there across the road, and we're going on a safari. I said, what are we hunting for? She said, anything we can find. Let's go. Man, we're on. We get to walking over there. We find empty turtle shells. Those are treasures. We find all kinds of stuff. We had the free reign of the place. We go back and we sit on the front porch. She wants a popsicle. She's going to get a popsicle. And so is her dad. I didn't know I was getting cheesecake or I'd held out on the popsicle. No, I'd eat the popsicle too. We sit on the front porch and we're sitting there and I tried to explain to her, Jordan, we are old school around here. She said, Daddy, what's old school? I said, well, let me help you try to understand that. I don't think she ever really got it, so I'll just keep teaching her what old school is, chasing goats and riding four-wheelers. I am there, ride or die. I am her, ride or die. But in this walk, you need somebody outside of that that knows you a little different than they do. There are some things she'll let me buy on because she knows I'm tired. There are some things she won't hold me necessarily to because she knows things ain't going just right or things are happening and she'll let me buy. But when I got a partner... What's the point? The point is here that Abram has partners. How do I know that? Because you go through here and you see that the scripture talks about that these guys here in verse 13 have made a covenant. They are confederate with him. They are his ride or die. Abraham knew the odds that were stacked against him and the dangers that he's facing. And it carries over into chapter 15. I've already preached to you about a lot of that. And, and Abraham knew the dangers and the things that he, was, that he was facing as he was headed towards the promised land. God's already promised him what he was going to do. And he's headed towards that promised land. And he's facing all those difficulties. And I want to say this to you. No person lays claim to a land that is occupied by others without facing opposition. I said no person lays claim to a land that's occupied by others without facing opposition. No person, no child of God. 
doesn't face any opposition as you're heading towards the promised land. Why? Because there's others trying to get it and there's an enemy that's trying to steal it from you. I need somebody in my life. You need somebody in your life. You need a partner along the way that will help you. And that's what these guys were. This, it, they are partners. It is only, it is only, our only hope is to join hands with other believers for mutual protection. That's what happened here. Are you still with me? I'm kind of skipping a little bit because I, I need to get done and we need to go home. What's happened here is, is that these guys listed in verse 13. One person escapes from the enemy and runs to the others to tell them what's going on. Everything's going to be okay at this time, at this moment, because Abram is confederate with some other folks. He has a partnership in this. They have a mutual agreement here that they made before the crisis started, before the war started. He had already made a pact with these guys. Go back and read it. That if there's war comes, if there's difficulties come, if there's crisis that comes, we are going to be ride or die through all of this. And I want to tell you in this room, we are to be as the people of God ride or die for each other Abram Abram listen I, this is a whole other sermon in itself Abram really should not be rescuing Lot yeah he's of age he's his own dude he's an adult he's the one that made the decision He's the one that picked up, packed up, loaded up, and moved to the valley of Sodom and pitched his tent towards Sodom. He's the one that did it. Abram really doesn't necessarily need to be involved. This is a, he's a big boy. But he's decided because, because he is one of his. And I have an agreement already with some folks that's going to walk with me through this. Let's go get him. Can I ask you, where are the people that have given their lives to Jesus Christ? Where are the people that have fallen out of fellowship? Where are the people that have fallen out? Well, pastor, that's your fault. You, you, the way you preach, the way you, 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 it's your job to go get them. It's, your, it, it's what we pay our tithe. It's, it's for you to go get them. No, sir, and no, ma'am. No, sir, no, ma'am. The Bible says in Ephesians that it's my job to preach, teach, and release you to do the ministry. It is all of our job to be ride or die for those that call this the body of Christ together. We ought, because we have an agreement. Come on. We have an agreement that's been made with us. It was signed in blood that Jesus will not leave us nor forsake us. The pact's already been made, and we ought to be doing whatever we can to go and rescue those back. Our only hope is that we join hands with other believers. I was watching the rodeo this afternoon. Uh, the uh, PBR, the, the pro the bull riding competitions are going on right now. Sorry, I've lost track of what I was trying to say. And they've, there's teams. So if you watch Keep Up With The Rodeo, this time of year, uh, they will make teams of rodeo so so these dudes are all on a team and those th that second row they're on a team that third row they're on a team they split them up and they've all got coaches and and they ride they they travel the country till the till the regular rodeo starts and they have these bull riding competitions and they're all teams and so they've got a coach that's coaching those guys all those guys are professional bull riders already but they're on a team so their team is trying to beat those teams in this bull riding competition it's not one against everybody else now it's this team against everybody else and the collective points decide who beats everybody else y'all with me i was watching it this afternoon trying to keep up with it jb mooney is a professional bull rider just retired he's been hurt so many times and so on just retired one of the best bull riders ever been on the back of a bull he was on there this afternoon he's a coach of one of those teams his team comes up to ride and they're riding and that dude is up on the rails man i mean that dude is just yelling and hollering for his team he is he is i mean he's on it he is a passionate dude if you watch rodeo jb mooney is passionate he's had bones i mean this dude's passionate bones broke everything he's hollering ride 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 and at the end of his team riding this afternoon, they interviewed him. 
And, and they said, J.B., you've retired and, and, um, and you're no longer riding. You really don't even have to be here. Yeah. And, and he's been yelling for his team so much he can hardly do the interview. And he said, ma'am, you're right. I don't have to be here. He said, but I'm the coach of this, of this team. This is my team. And he said, I'm here to coach them. And the lady said, well, J.B., what's the success of a team in bull riding? What's the success? He said, well, I can tell you what's not successful. He said, if I get one person on my team that is not pulling their weight, it affects my entire team, so I won't allow it. Woo, I thought, man, let's get that dude to come preach for us. Come on, somebody. He said, if I get one man on my team that wants to talk or yeah, yeah, or anything else, he said, it affects my entire team, and I won't have it. The only thing that we can hope for in these last days is that we are all confederate and we are all together and we have one purpose which is soul, soul, souls and making it for our faith to become sight. That's the goal. Lord, said what I could say tonight and so I hope you'll take it this morning and I hope you'll take it, Lord. And Help it to sink into our spirit. Help it to sink into our soul. and Help us, Lord, to understand our purpose, our each individual purpose. First is to be people of courage and people of faith. Lord, no preacher can preach that up. No teacher can teach that up. It is based on experience, our experience with you. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to have faith. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be people of courage. When it comes to the things of God, I pray, Lord, that uh, you'll help us to do that. I pray you'll give us a boldness in our witnessing. Lord, I pray today that uh, you would help us to protect the front door. Lord, I pray that you would help us to protect the front door of our spirit, of our soul. Lord, there are so many ways the enemy gains access, so many things that he does. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to protect them all. Help us to be aware, Lord, of places maybe where we have left cracks in the door or even an open door in our own lives. I pray, Lord, that uh, once that's pointed out in our life, that you would help us to seal that door, keep it closed. So while your head's bowed and your eyes closed, thank you for coming tonight and Hope you'll bring somebody with you on Wednesday and back next Sunday. Before you go, could you just on your own set where you are? And could you just ask the Lord, Lord, is there any open door? Is there any unlocked door? Is there any crack that I've left in the door? Because the Lord doesn't want the door just half shut. Half shut is just as well as full open. A door that is cracked is just as well as a door wide open or if not even there. Lord, what doors may be cracked in my life? Help me to shut those doors in the enemy's face, Lord. I don't want to give the enemy any place in my life. Would you show me what those may be? And I'll tell you that when you start to ask, he's going to show you. Some of you already know they're there. Some of you don't even have to ask the Lord. You know what they are. You know what those doors are. And so tonight your prayer would be, Lord, help me to slam those doors in the face of the enemy. Help me, Lord, to leave those doors closed and to not return to open them again. So as you do that, for the next 60 seconds, you're going to stand on your feet. Pastor Zach is going to lead us in a song, and he's going to let us go. It doesn't take hours and hours of praying through to find this out. It doesn't take hours and hours of knowing what the answer to this is. And, hey, there may be no doors in your life that's open. If that isn't, if there's not, hey, pray for the person next to you. Would we all just do it for 60 seconds? Would you ask the Lord? Lord, is there anything in my life that I need to close shut this this afternoon?
if you just lift your hands one more time across the sanctuary. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And we praise you for your word tonight. Lord, you said that it would never go out and return back to you void. And so, Lord, I pray that every life that heard this word tonight, God, that we would be forever changed by your presence and by your power and by your word. God, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hug somebody, high five somebody, shake somebody's hand, and let them know you're glad to see them in the house of God tonight. We'll see you back here Wednesday night.